So we have the forces of nature, right? We have electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force. And then we have the kinds of matter particles like electrons and muons, quarks. We have the particles that carry the forces like um, uh, gluons and photons, the W and Z bosons. And then in the background of everything, we have the Higgs field which gives mass to electrons and muons and quarks and so forth. And the Higgs field has an interesting place because those other particles we already knew about by the 70s, the Higgs field was posited in the 1960s. And by the 1970s, by the end of the 1970s, I would say, the idea that there was a Higgs field fit the data so well that everybody believed it. But we didn't actually discover it until the year 2012 with the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. It took an enormous expenditure of effort and ingenuity to actually find that particle. But here's the thing. This was a wonderful, wonderful discovery in 2012 when we finally found the Higgs boson, putting the finishing touches on the standard model of particle physics. There's two, two interesting things about that fact uh, in, in particular. One is we all expected it, like I just said. Even though we didn't discover the Higgs boson directly until 2012, everyone, all the major particle physicists by the 1970s, thought it was there. In the 1960s and early on in the 1970s, there were a series of experimental discoveries that were quite surprising. You know, the structure of what happens inside protons and neutrons, the number of different families of particles, stuff like that, different symmetries being violated. The 60s and 70s really surprised us in terms of experimental findings in particle physics. But like I said, by the end of the 70s, we had the standard model put into place. We hadn't discovered it all but we knew what it was. We knew what the predictions were. We predicted what we call the W boson, the Z boson, the top quark, the tau neutrino, the Higgs boson. None of these had been discovered by the late 1970s. But since then, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, we found all of them. What we've not done in that time is any experiment that gave us a result that surprised us. The standard model of particle physics was put into place in the 1970s, and all we've been able to do, despite our best efforts, is confirm that it's right. That is weird and bizarre and preposterous. That's almost too good. The standard model shouldn't be that good. It was put together in the 70s. If you have a car from the 70s, you're very, very lucky if it still runs. But here is this incredibly intricate mathematical machinery describing the fundamental forces of nature that works better than ever. That's a little bit puzzling. Here's the other puzzle, that Higgs boson that we have, right? Exactly like the dark energy, exactly like the energy of empty space, you can guess how massive the Higgs boson should be. You can, you can ask yourself, in the context of quantum field theory, you can say, well, if I didn't know any better, what would I expect? Just like have expectations for what the early universe should be like, expectations for the vacuum energy, you have expectation for the Higgs as well. The answer is that the Higgs boson should be way more massive than it actually is, something like a quadrillion times as massive as it actually is. There's this huge difference between the ultra high energy scales that we have in gravity and other forces of nature and the energy scale we see in the Higgs boson or more generally in what we call the weak interactions which the Higgs bosons participate in. This is called the hierarchy problem. The hierarchy problem is why is there's such a big difference between the mass of the Higgs, which is relatively low, and the ultra high energy scales of particle physics. It's not what you would expect. But you know, particle physicists don't just sit around and complain about it, they try to solve it. So people suggested a whole bunch of possible solutions to the hierarchy problem. And guess what? They all, more or less, every one of them, all the most promising ones anyway, predicted that the Large Hadron Collider would find the Higgs boson, but also find a whole bunch of other particles. The Large Hadron Collider has not done that. We have not found any other particles, any new particles besides the Higgs boson. Not yet, anyway. It's always possible that, that you know, tomorrow we will find some, so don't quote me on this, but as of the last time I checked the internet, we had not found any particles beyond the standard model of particle physics at the Large Hadron Collider. And partly you just say, well, that's too bad, it's unfortunate, but it's worse than that. We really had what we thought were good principled reasons 
to say that a natural, sensible, non-preposterous theory would predict other new particles at the LHC, and they're not there. Something is going on. What is it? I'm not sure. But let me bring up the third standard model we have, which is gravity, okay? This is our best standard model in some sense because it's the first that it came before uh, the standard cosmological model or the standard model of particle physics. It came from Albert Einstein in 1915. We celebrated the 100th anniversary of general relativity just a little while ago. General relativity is Einstein's idea that space-time, the four-dimensional world in which we live, is not a static fixed background. It has a life of its own. It's dynamical. It can be warped and curved and bent. And you and I experience those warpings and bendings as the force of gravity. Einstein says that what gravity is, is the curvature of space-time. And he doesn't just make that poetic assertion. He gives you an equation, which we call Einstein's equation, which tells you exactly how space-time curves in response to matter and energy, okay? It's a beautiful theory. Einstein, you know, he wrote down his equation again in 1915. From that equation, you can predict that there should be something called black holes, that there should be something called gravitational waves, that the black holes should spiral into each other and give off gravitational waves, and we should be able to detect them here on Earth, which we finally just did just a couple years ago at the LIGO Observatory. And uh, there's a couple of LIGO observatories, the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory. So. Almost a hundred years, over a hundred years pass in between Einstein writing down the equation and us once again showing that this incredibly super high precision prediction of that equation turns out to be true. It's an amazing testimony to the power both of the human mind to come up with the equation, but also of physics. You know, Einstein didn't know about black holes. He didn't know about gravitational waves. He was working on the basis of general principles and he was able to construct a theory that predicted them. Everything that we've done in astrophysics and cosmology is completely compatible with general relativity, as far as we can tell. That's what makes it a good standard model. Again, zero evidence that the general relativity is not correct as far as experiments are concerned. At the same time, we know general relativity is not correct. At least it's not the final answer. There are puzzles in general relativity. One I already mentioned, right? The Big Bang. General relativity predicts infinitely large amounts of energy and curvature of space-time at the Big Bang. The equations themselves break down. You want to try to do better. We don't know how. But more fundamentally, we know that at the deepest levels, the universe obeys the rules of quantum mechanics, right? The universe is not classical. And as different as relativity is from Newtonian physics, it's still in the same spirit. Both special relativity and general relativity live within the paradigm, the framework of classical Newtonian mechanics. Quantum mechanics is something altogether different. Quantum mechanics says that you cannot make predictions with absolute accuracy for the observational outcomes of your experiments. It says that objects do not have exact locations or speeds through the universe and so forth. All of the other forces of nature, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the Higgs boson, electromagnetism, all of these things, fit in perfectly well into the quantum mechanical framework, general relativity does not. General relativity does not yet have a perfectly good quantum mechanical theory for which it is the classical limit or the classical approximation. And we've known this for a long time, okay? We've known that general relativity was not really fitting in well with the quantum framework, but it's very hard to actually make progress because there's no experiments we can do. If you think about it, the natural kind of experiment you would want to do to reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics is to have an object which was large enough to create a noticeable gravitational field and small enough to behave quantum mechanically. But to make a big gravitational field, you need something that is at least kilograms to measure its gravitational field, whereas to behave quantum mechanically, you want something the size of an atom or something like that. There is a fundamental discrepancy there. So we're not able to do experiments that teach us how to quantize gravity. What we can do are thought experiments, and that we're really good at. You know, the theoretical physics community is really good at imagining thought experiments. So here's a thought experiment. Take a black hole, 
A black hole is just so much matter and energy has squeezed into a tiny region of space that gravity has become so strong, light itself cannot escape. So the black hole is that region of space from which light itself cannot escape. Stephen Hawking, who again, back in the 60s and 70s, he was friends and collaborators with Roger Penrose. They helped us understand black holes. And Hawking did a brilliant thing. He said, okay, we don't know the quantum mechanical theory of gravity, but what we can do is take a situation in general relativity like a black hole and do quantum mechanics on top of it. In other words, we can imagine the behavior of quantum particles and fields, photons, electrons, neutrinos, and so forth, in the background of a black hole. And what he discovered, to everyone's surprise, circa 1974, was that black holes aren't completely black. They give off radiation. The quantum mechanical evolution of a black hole is not just to sit there, but to gradually evaporate, to disappear. You make a black hole and it will give off light and, and matter and energy, and that decreases the energy in the black hole, which therefore shrinks. If you let that happen all the way, then eventually the black hole completely disappears. Here's the problem with that raises. This is an awesome thing. Like, you know, it's great triumph. We haven't again observed it directly. It's outside our experimental reach right now, but we have every reason to believe that, that basic story is correct. And so, but it brings up a thought experiment puzzle. And, you know, I like to say that Hawking's real legacy is not this discovery that black holes evaporate, but the puzzles that that discovery uh, raises for us. The puzzle is this, take a book, take my books, take something deeply hidden, throw it into a black hole, okay? If you take a book and you destroy it, if you throw it in the water, or you burn it or something like that, according to the laws of physics, even though in practice, the information that was in that book is now lost to you. If you burn a book, you can't read it anymore. In principle, if you collected every particle, every photon of light, every little speck of dust from that book, in principle, you could reconstruct what was in the book. Whereas according to Hawking's calculation, if you throw a book into a black hole and let it evaporate, even in principle, the information that was in that, black, in that book is now gone, has been destroyed by the process of black holes evaporating. <laughs> and this is something that makes no sense. This is again, preposterous land. This is something where we, we don't have experimental evidence that it's wrong, but many of the most cherished principles that physicists like to believe in, conservation of information over time, seem to be violated by this. So this is the closest that we have to an experimental clue about the behavior of quantum gravity, because many, many physicists, myself included, think that somehow, the information does get out of the black hole. We don't know how, we have some ideas, we have some clever ideas, but we're not sure how.